In this lecture on basic logic, we'll continue our discussion of logical equivalence, truth, and the nature of contradiction. Each of the examples Teller gives of logical equivalence in this chapter can be used as what we're going to call equivalence rules when we get to natural deduction. And that'll make more sense as we go on. By now, after reading the first two chapters and listening to the last two lectures, I'm sure you've noticed some of the discrepancies I warned you about in the first lecture, and more will follow. I prefer to call this propositional logic over sentence logic, because propositions are the real subjects of arguments. Statements, which are sentences that can be either true or false, take the place of propositions when we put them down on paper. So sentence logic is an accurate description, however, the meaning of those statements can be expressed in many different sentences. But they will always refer to the same proposition that the arguer has in mind. Think of pro-choice versus anti-abortion here as an example of what I'm saying. The two are different ways of expressing potentially the same thing. I also use different sentence letter conventions. I start everything with P's and Q's, which is quite common. Some people like to use letters that remind them of the semantics of the argument. For example, when Teller formalizes an argument about Adam, he may use a capital A, or when discussing Eve, he may use a capital E. It's up to you. None of these details really matter. The logic is the same. But moving forward, I'll also use more traditional logic language than Teller. Teller will use descriptions such as conditional elimination where I will sometimes use Latin phrases like modus ponens. But enough of this, let's get back to the chapter. The first example of logical equivalence Teller gives is the double negation, or the negated negation. Just as in English and mathematics, a double negative equals a positive in logic, and the truth table shows this clearly. Teller explains it concisely. The law of double negation for any sentence P, P and not not P are logically equivalent. Next is De Morgan's Law, described at the end of the last lecture. Teller explains this equivalence as such. De Morgan's Law. For any sentence P and Q, not P and Q is logically equivalent to not P or not Q. And not P or Q is logically equivalent to not P, and not Q. Teller gives great explanations in this chapter, along with Venn diagrams for clarification, but I'll continue to use truth tables to demonstrate equivalences. Next are the distributive laws. For any three sentences, P, Q, and R, P and Q or R is logically equivalent to P and Q or P and R, and P or Q and R is logically equivalent to P or Q and P or R. Teller also introduces the law of substitution of logical equivalence. Suppose that X and Y are logically equivalent, and suppose that X occurs as a sentence of some larger sentence, Z. Let Z star be the new sentence obtained by substituting y for x in z. Then, z is logically equivalent to z star. All this means is that equivalent statements can be substituted for each other. Teller also introduces the law of transitivity of logical equivalence, but a single read understanding of these concepts will suffice for this course. We're just trying to build towards a functional understanding of logic right now, so we can think logically. We can get more theoretical on our own time, or in future logical pursuits. For now, it's more important that we just get through the remaining equivalence laws. Next is the commutative law. For any sentence P and Q, P and Q is logically equivalent to Q and P, and P or Q is logically equivalent to Q or P. CM is pretty straightforward, so I'll just leave this explanation at that. Next is the associative law. For any sentence, X, Y, and Z, 
X and Y and Z, X and Y and Z, and X and Y and Z are logically equivalent to each other, which is pretty straightforward. And X or Y or Z, X or Y or Z, and X or Y or Z are logically equivalent to each other. Compound conjunctions and disjunctions with four or more conjuncts or disjuncts can be grouped similarly in arbitrariness. This seems more complicated than it is. Since these are combinations using the same operators, it doesn't matter how they are paired. If one atomic statement is false in a conjunction, then the compound statement is false. If one atomic statement in a disjunction is true, then the whole compound statement is true. The next law that seems trivially true is the law of redundancy. For any statement P, P and P is logically equivalent to P. Similarly, P or P is logically equivalent to P. This simple little law always reminds me of stopping by the woods on a snowy evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound is sweep of easy wind and blowing flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. I've always loved that poem, even if it is about death. And I don't care about sounding basic anymore. But to turn back to a heartless logician from being a heartful human, if I tell you that I have miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep, there is no logical difference between that and just saying it once, I have miles to go. Indeed, there's no there's nothing added when I say to you that I'm going to the bar and I'm going to the bar. I've just said the same thing twice. Logically, if someone asked you what I told you, you could honestly reply to them that I said I was going to the bar and nothing else. So to turn to logical truths and contradictions, this next section is pretty simple, but it's also troubling for many new philosophers and prospective logicians. Please try not to be offended by this. I didn't make any of this up. It's just how logic works. There is such a thing as logical truth. A logical truth is any statement that is true in every possible case. The proposition P or not P is a logical truth. And we can prove it with a simple truth table. So, if you say you believe something P and I say I don't believe something that is not P, then one of us is wrong. One of us has to be. On the flip side of logical truth is logical contradiction, and again, please try not to be offended. If we disagree on something, and I were to say, what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me, I would be saying that P and its opposite, not P, are both true at the same time which would be written in logic as P and not P. And here's the trouble. If you look at the truth table for P and not P, you'll see that the belief is always false. And this is the core belief of relativism. Therefore, pure relativism is logically indefensible. Logical truth and contradiction also provides us with useful tools for pure logic the law of logically true conjunct. If X is any sentence and Y is any logical truth, then X and Y is logically equivalent to X. Furthermore, anytime you see a statement in an argument, it can be conjoined with any other statement in that argument because both are true. The law of contradictory disjunct. If any X is any sentence and Y is any contradiction, then 
x or y is logically equivalent to x. The ability to introduce disjunctions actually goes beyond disjoining existing premises with logical contradictions. As we'll see later, since a disjunction is true when either disjunct is true, you can disjoin any new atomic statement to an existing statement and the disjunction will still be true. The disjunctive normal form and the Scheffer stroke. This section is more important for concepts in metalogic like functional and expressive completeness. If you aspire to specialize in logic as a discipline, these will be important concepts to thoroughly understand. There also appear to be some typos in the Scheffer stroke section. However, as this is a basic logic course in support of a critical thinking and writing course, I'll not treat these concepts here. I'll only cover what I consider to be the most necessary for our basic logic. In the next section, we'll discuss validity in more depth and make our simple logical language more powerful with the introduction of conditional statements.